Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. Can I move this? Just, am I going to move this? Okay. Verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and about, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by his spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul, also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. We come to this text tonight, it's speaking of a man in Simeon. This is the only place in the entire Bible that we hear of this man. And there's many things that are brought forth about him. But we also see something that drives his praise, something that drives his uh, thoughts on salvation. But it starts out by with, and behold. Of course, you all know this is a simple word uh, that always wants to bring our attention to what has been said and to what now is being said for this one person that's being talked about. In verse 21, it speaks of uh, what they had done for Jesus before Simeon comes into the picture. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy in the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said to the law of the Lord. A pair of two turtle doves, or a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. This brings us up to our text tonight. It has the idea of what had to be done that was established back in Leviticus. I believe it was chapter 12. There's now something that had to be done for Jesus as he's brought into this world. He had to follow the same law that was set forth by every single other uh, person had to follow. But we also see something of his parents here. They had to bring him that he might accomplish these laws, fulfill these laws. He not only had to uh, be circumcised, he also had to be, uh, his mother had to be cleansed for it was her first child she had. Think the sacrifices had to be done so that he could now be right in the Lord, of course. Uh, we see a good picture of parents here trying to raise their son according to what the Lord has put forth. But we also see something of their humility. What did they have to offer? A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. We know if you go back to the first chapter, we see Mary and Joseph that they were nothing special financial wise. They were nothing special when it comes to what they had in possessions. But what their humility shown is why they were chosen to be these people that would bring this one into the earth. There was one that would raise them up and then God would anoint them with his spirit. They give these two young pigeons that he can now be presented and he's now brought to the temple. But now we come to this man called Simeon. This one is presented in this text and we learn everything we can about him in this text for he's not mentioned anywhere else as I said. But we also learn of his prayer, his praise. And we learn of his salvation. And behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. Simeon, who's his, we know his name now, is the simple idea of God has heard. It's what his name means. It's the idea that he has been a man of prayer for many years. As it says in the next statement, he's been waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's been in prayer for something. He's been waiting for something to come about. As we read earlier, we 
are going to hear that there's a promise made to them. That he's waiting for something else even after he waits for the consolation of Israel. But he finds out that's the same person. Simeon is one who has been in prayer for many years as he waited for this. But he's also just and devout. This word just simply has the idea of righteousness. And of course we see that right in the next word devout, devoted to God. But the real idea is the righteousness he has in Christ. This righteousness that he's in the right view from God. He's in the right standing with God. But how does he get to that point? He had to have faith somewhere. We find that in the next statement. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. I believe it's Isaiah 41. If you'll abide with me and let me find it real quick. As I said, I wasn't planning for this, but I know where I'm going. Isaiah 40, verse 1. We hear a word that is used three times in this, in this one, or twice in this text. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We well, see this word comfort being applied in those verses. Is the same idea that is now in the New Testament in the Greek. We now see this word consolation as the idea of a comfort that will come to Israel. Of course, they said in that in Isaiah 40 that the pardon had been made, the sins had been removed, they had been paid for. So we know this consolation that Simeon is waiting for is none other than the one he's about to meet. But there's something else we must pay attention to. It's the consolation of Israel. He's a comfort. But what does it say in John 14 in the high priestly prayer? I don't want us to get confused. It says, another comforter is coming. I will send him to you. So this first comforter, who would that be? That would be Jesus. And then he sends another comforter. Or are we to say that one was not a comforter and one is? Well, no, that simple, that word another has a simply the idea of one of the same kind. Jesus came to be the comforter and made it possible that we could be comforted and the Spirit now applies that to us. Something had to be done that it could now be applied. So we don't have another comforter. No, we have the comforter now set for us that has to come to accomplish his will, his Father's will. That is the one Simeon is about to meet. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. This tells us something of what this meeting is being brought about by. Of course, we know that Joseph and Mary have brought Jesus for these laws to be fulfilled. But I don't think it's outside the Bible to say that God could have set that up long ago just for this one meeting right here. But he also has the Holy Ghost upon Simeon that he can now make this meeting together that Simeon could meet Jesus before he leaves out of here. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he has seen the Lord's Christ. We now see a promise made to Simeon. Simeon is now told that he will not leave this world. He will continue to wait. He will continue to pray. But there is no way getting out of here until he sees one thing, one person, the Lord's Christ. Now... Depending on who you talk to, you might have problems right there. Why is it the Lord's Christ? Well, whose will is he coming to fulfill? Who sent him? The Father sent his Son into this world that he might die for me and you. He's now fulfilling his will. This is the Lord's Christ that's now been sent. That he might fulfill the work of redemption for me and you. Simeon, and he came by the Spirit, in verse 27, into the temple... And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him, um, him up in his arms and blessed God and said, So we now have Simon who has followed the Spirit. It tells us something about the way he is a follower of Christ. He's a follower of God. So not only knows about his prayer life, we know how, his faith. He's now brought to this place where he's going to meet Christ. 
Then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, This sets us up for our song of Simeon. In Latin, now I didn't take Latin, so if I don't say this right, y'all won't know either, I don't figure. <laughs> it's the nuke dementis. It has the idea of Simeon's dismissal. You heard dismissus, dismissal. Simeon is now going to sing a song because he knows who he's meeting. But what does his song consist of? That's what we got to pay attention to. What does his praise consist of? We know his prayer was about waiting for one person. We know what he was, who he was following. The Spirit was upon him and it was sending them. But what does his praise consist of? Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He makes it very clear in this word, Lord. How does he start out his praise? Well, he knows who he's talking to for the, most, for the one thing we know. Because this word Lord is not simply just curios. It's not just a common name for Lord, the one God of this world. No, it has the idea of master. We see it used other places. No, he says master. Now lettest thou thy servant. Well, this is where people get out of kilter with this, this text. Because the word servant is that word doulos. It's the word slave. If he sees someone as his master, he has to see himself as a slave. It makes sense when he says we, he was following the Spirit to this text or to this place. It makes sense that he was praying continuously waiting for that which that God was to bring about. So it, does, it makes perfect sense that he would now call himself a slave to this master, which is his God that he's been following, that he's had faith in, and that he's going to follow wherever he sins. According to thy word, what is this word he's talking about? This promise that had been made that he would leave out of here when he's seen the Lord's Christ. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Well, now we come to this part of what does he see? What does he tell us in his praise? He's going to leave. He's going to depart in peace. But why can he do this? He grounds his argument. He gives us a reason why he can do this. For mine eyes, his own eyes have seen Whose salvation? God's salvation. He has seen Jesus Christ. Now, if you're like me, I know I'm not the best with kids. But they run up to you and the first thing you want to do is either picking them up. And I'm not a grandparent, but I've watched enough grandparents to know they pick them up, maybe sit them on their knee. Maybe pick them up, hold them and play with them. Maybe talk to them, tell them whatever they might be thinking. But you know there's other people in that court there in that temple outside in the temple courts. You know there's other people standing there, maybe sitting there looking around. Of course, you know there's money changing, there's stuff going on. But you have this old man getting ready to leave this world. He's now holding this baby right here. And he's excited and he's praising God. I have seen thy salvation. Of course, people are sitting there. Why is Simeon so excited about this one he's holding? Why is Simeon so excited. It's just another baby. Well, the problem is they're not looking at the right person. If you look at Christ, the one he's holding, then they understand everything that Simeon is now saying. He's praising the one who is now his salvation, the one he is now holding, this Christ that is now in his arms, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. My plan tonight was to go to Psalm 19. We see in the first six verses that in creation God has revealed himself to us. We've seen that somebody had to create this world. But in verses 7 through 9, we see that his word reveals him to us. We see God in his word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's going to describe in that word of God something we had to have that we might know him. If God has prepared all this in front of all people, then there has been something that has to be revealed to us. There's a work being done in front of us. But how does Simeon now know? 
Of course, we know Simeon has been praying this whole time, so he's had faith. He showed us his faith. He's been a man of faith throughout this text. And he knows who his salvation is. We see that in his praise. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. And he knows that this salvation has been prepared since the before the foundation of the world. In Psalm 19, we see that God set forth his glory by revealing everything to us. He got glory by revealing in creation who he was. He gets glory by revealing to us what his divine revelation is in verses 7, 8, and 9. We see his word of God reveals everything that we need. It reveals what we need. He done it for his glory that we might return his glory back to him. There's a response there. But now Simeon says the most important thing for me and you in this text which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Now we could go to Isaiah 8. I believe that's where I've seen it today. And he fulfills what is said in Isaiah 8. That he sent him one that will be a light to his people. This light is the one he's now holding. It is God's salvation. Thy salvation, as Simeon says. A light to lighten the Gentiles. The only light that could shine into this world and do anything for us. The light that can only one that could reveal anything to us. I've heard the illustration before of if you was in a dark room and you closed the doors, closed all the shutters or blinds, closed everything that would block out every single bit of light, and you're sitting in complete darkness, there's still one light that can get in. There's still one light that can penetrate the darkest darkness. And it's this light that he's now holding, Jesus Christ. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Now, of course, we know that he had sent for this person to be the king that we've been long awaiting, of course, for the Israelites. But it's not the king they're looking for because they wanted the glory for themselves and not the glory to be for God. That's why this one now being held by Simeon is going to be a glory to the people of Israel. But it's going to be for God's glory. But now we have the reaction. We've had Simeon's praise. We know what he had in his heart about this one person he's been waiting on. Of course, we know he's about to leave this world. But he does something for Joseph and Mary. What does he tell them? And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Well, if you're marveling, you're awestruck. Something's hit you that you don't understand. Something hit you that you cannot, was not able to fathom at one point. They now hear that not only has Jesus come for the Israel, for the Israelites. Oh no, he's come for the Gentiles. No, he's come for every single one that he will call. He's come for every single one that he will save. He's come to save the lost. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. This fall and rising, of course, we know from other texts, it tells us that he will be a stumbling block. But he does not have to be a stumbling block. No, he could lift us up by the miry clay. He could bring us out of darkness into the marvelous light. But no, he's a stumbling block to those who refuse to see him as a savior. They refuse to have reverence for him. They refuse to see him as God and Lord and our savior. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine also own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed Simeon now gives his last bit of wisdom that he could give to Mary there's going to be a sword driven through your own soul soul. this person has to go has a plan determined place to die he tells Mary you will suffer losing your son and it will not be an easy way it will not be a soft way. No, it will be the worst way through crucifixion. 
It will be the worst place he could be sent to die. To the place where he could not even be recognized as the word says. No, even Mary's going to have to experience this suffering that Jesus goes through. It's going to be that to even point that she sees her son die on a cross. But we know, as I've spoken before, there's another comforter who comes along. He applies these truths to Mary and gives to her that this son is living again. And now applies this truth to our heart that we now know that we have a risen Savior. And that we can live just as Simeon did. As a man of prayer, as a man of praise, as a man of faith. And then everything you see here in his praise, in his salvation, he says it is all of God. It was all of grace. And it was all by the work of this one he is now holding in his arms. And that he knows he will now leave this world. But he looks forward to that day when Christ will die. He knows that's where his faith lies. And he knows that where his faith will be completed on that cross in Calvary.